Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Ground Rounds, Radiology in the COVID World. This morning you'll be receiving two lectures from the Radiology Emergency Radiologist Frontline Workers. They are Dr. Lee Myers speaking on COVID-19 outbreak, impact on imaging, and Dr. Ali Ghalamrazanazad speaking on COVID-19 imaging findings. My name is Dr. Allison Wilcox. I'm the Section Chief for Cardiothoracic Imaging. I'm also the Medical Director for Radiology for Keck Hospital. There are individual medical directors for all of our individual facilities, including LA County, Norris, as well as HCC2. You can email any of us individually for each of those sites, but if you'd ever like to email me, this is my email address. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions from any of the sites if, if able or direct you to somebody who can. Dr. Rosen asked me to give you some insights on how to communicate more directly with the radiologists at all sites. I was fortunate enough to do internal medicine here um, before I started my radiology residency and that was so long ago when you used to have to walk to work uphill in the snow each way in Los Angeles. Um, but also we were made to come down to the radiology department with our papers in hand and be punished each time we would ask for something from the radiologist. And I felt very fortunate that I was a radiology resident at least and I could navigate the system a little bit and I realize that's not available for all of you. Um, so I hope some of this information will be helpful. I'd first like to draw your attention to this website, trojanimaging.com. This is a website that we developed and it's filled with a bunch of really important information that we use on a daily basis. We leave this open on our desktops at work. It includes a bunch of intranet links. It also has literature and references and calculators that we use on a daily basis. But if you scroll down to the middle of the document, you will see a list of radiology directories which you can click on and open um, and these are open to all of you some of the the links in here are password protected but um, these are not and many of them within the um, trojanimaging.com website are not but if you click on any of these this will expand open and will give you all of the reading rooms that might be available to you um, for example for example, if you expand the LA County directory, this is what it would look like. You'll see chest x-ray, multiple CT bodies, GIGU, neuro, etc. You'll also see some after hours numbers that you might find useful. A little bit of a caveat here, there are multiple CT numbers you'll see listed. Um, no one person owns these workstations. The phone is tied to the workstation. The workstation might not work so well, so we'll skip around. So um, try one, and if that doesn't work, go to the next one. Um, but we should be able to help you with one of those few numbers that might be sitting there. This is what Keck Medical Center looks like. There's one number for the reading room phone tree for Keck Hospital. Uh, for example, if you wanted to get in touch with neuroradiology, you would hit one, um, body imaging three, and, the, and then that would populate another tree. For, so for example, this is the body imaging reading room extensions, which populate under three. But it also has a bunch of other information in it. So for example, here's the CT suite at Keck and the number for that. So for example, if you wanted to find out where your patient was on the CT list, if it was first, second, or tenth, and why, um, so you can better navigate your day, but this might be um, helpful for you to call. Dr. Rosen also asked me to give you some information on some specialty contacts. As I already stated, I'm the cardiothoracic imaging director, so I would be the person you would contact if you had a question on what do you want to do on a patient who has presumptive myocarditis and EKG findings such as this, etc. Um, so you contact me. Also for any Keck Hospital concerns, please do let me know. For MSK, it would be Dr. White, Neuroradiology, Paul Kim, Head and Neck Radiology, John Go. For the interventionalists, I, I thought about giving a specific person. Mike Katz is the um, section chief, but it really is dependent on who's there at any particular time, and they're the ones who are actually going to be doing the procedure, so I would say that that would be pretty site-specific. For urology or Norris concerns, Dr. Vinay Doodlewar. For prostate or liver imaging questions, Suzanne Palmer.
For ultrasound questions, Dr. Ed Grant. For general body questions, including body MR, Gil Wong. Norris questions can be Phil Chang or Vinay Dudelwar. For GI imaging, including fluoroscopy at all sites, Tapas Tahura. County CT body concerns should be Armin, but I, I would say that um, he's concerned very much with CT flow in general and often speaks to neuro CT cases um, as neuro uh, protocols are not um, very deviant. They, they tend to be pretty routine. So um, Armin tends to be involved on a daily basis. For the emergency department, Dr. Kassara, mammography, Dr. Larson, and for nuclear medicine, Dr. Coletti. So please feel free to make note of any of these names. Um, let us all know we're all in MedMail um, and uh, we're happy to help. So on that note, thank you very much for your attention. And once again, I'll remind you of my email address. If you'd like to reach out to me about anything, I'm happy to help. And I would like to introduce Dr. Lee Myers. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining this lecture. I would also like to thank Dr. Rosen for inviting radiology to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today, I'll be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on imaging and how ultimately this will affect our patients and referring clinicians. I have nothing to disclose. My hope is this lecture will act as a primer for both the current impact on imaging, but also in the upcoming months. I'd like to take you into the world of radiology, which can lead you to a better understanding of the inner workings of radiology, recognize the impact on imaging throughput and potential delays, as well as examine radiology safety practices, which will ultimately protect our patients and staff. Radiology can be a black box to many staff and clinicians. I remember when I was an intern, I would handwrite imaging orders, which included things like the exam, indication, if it was routine or stat, but really the floor clerk is what made it all happen. What we would see is the transporter come and pick up the patient. Time would pass, the patient returned from radiology, the images were available, and a short time later, a report was also available. What I didn't understand was the process behind the scenes to allow all of this to take place. I'd like to share the policies and procedures during the COVID-19 pandemic to help illuminate the inner workings of radiology. The policies we have in place are to decrease transmission, which can be from patient to patient, patient to staff, or staff to patient, as well as decrease impact on imaging throughput. I like to think of radiology as an intersection between departments. What I mean is we receive patients from the majority of clinical departments. When we are running business as usual, even during our busy hours, we don't get a lot of traffic jams. We can anticipate stress in our system, whether that's increased number of patients, decreased staff, or even equipment failure. We can increase the number of staff, pull staff from other sections, or we can utilize additional equipment. The best analogy that I could come up with regarding radiology and the COVID-19 pandemic is imagine you're at a busy intersection and the signal lights are blinking red. A couple cars go by, followed by a pause, and then some more cars go. Overall, there's a substantial slowdown of traffic and frustration, or in radiology, that would be akin to imaging throughput and frustration from our patients and providers. The signal lights will not fully function until the pandemic has receded. However, similar to adding a traffic officer, we have created processes that will decrease the impact on imaging. Why are we talking about intersection between different departments and what is the process that is causing decreased throughput? One major cause of inefficiencies in radiology throughput is the lack of communication or interfacing difficulties of the other black boxes in the hospital. Changes in procedures and policies in these black boxes can lead to confusion for radiology. I'd like to share with you an example. Recently, there was a patient that had a CT abdomen pelvis in the emergency department. And when reviewing the chart, I saw the patient was on droplet precautions and also had a COVID-19 test pending. 
These were performed after the CT was performed, and our technologists did not use PPEs for droplet precautions, nor did they decontaminate the room. When I talked with the emergency medicine physician, she said that the patient only got the COVID-19 test because they were admitting the patient to the ICU, which she explained to me was a mandatory process and the patient did not have any symptoms of COVID-19. Radiology uses the precautions in the electronic medical record to determine if a terminal clean is needed, which will take down our scanner for at least an hour. This is just one example of how policies in other departments can affect throughput for radiology. We may receive patients from multiple departments at the same time. In normal circumstances, this doesn't pose too much of an issue, especially for CT, because we can do those fairly quickly. However, if we have multiple patients with or suspected COVID-19, we'll have to take down the scanner for about an hour and do a terminal clean. This can lead to build up a patient queues to be scanned. In normal circumstances, if we have three to four CTs to perform, we could do those within an hour or so. So the priority of each patient, unless it was a stat exam, didn't really matter much. Typically, we had the clerks decide who came down first unless they had other instructions. During the COVID-19 pandemic, those three or four CT scans could take hours to get done. And this all depends on the response time for EBS for their terminal cleans. This makes triaging these patients very important. A major cause of the diminished imaging throughput is cleaning of the equipment and room, which is dependent on environmental services response time. Another important reason to understand how radiology is an intersection between many different departments is the potential for cross transmission. We have hundreds of patients coming through radiology each day. These patients come within six feet of each other when traveling down the hall or potentially when they're moving from the waiting area to the scanner, but also when a transporter drops a patient off, they may drop the patient off in close proximity to another. So radiology can become a potential hotspot for transmission of COVID-19. There can be patient-to-patient -patient transmission, and this is why we limit the number of COVID-19 patients that can be waiting for a scan in the radiology department. One of the factors that make this worse is what I like to call drive-by drop-offs from the transport team. They will drop the patient off and won't stay until the study is complete. In these cases, we keep the patient in the CT room, which ultimately increases the time before EVS can clean the room. Patient-to-patient -patient transmission can also occur from equipment that has not been properly decontaminated our current policy is to perform terminal cleans after each patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. These terminal cleans take about one hour to complete. Patient to staff and staff to patient transmission can occur when proper PPEs are not in use, or if the patient or staff are not suspected of COVID-19 and droplet precautions are not utilized. Our ultrasound techs are at the most risk due to the long exam times in close proximity to the patient. Now that we have talked about how radiology receives patients from many different departments, let's dive into the inner workings of radiology to help illuminate our policies and procedures. I think it's important to look at the imaging chain of cross-sectional imaging, which is a stepwise review from the time the examination is ordered until the radiologist communicates these findings, typically in the form of a report. We'll be talking about the imaging chain for cross-sectional examinations such as CT, MRI, and ultrasound in the context of emergency department patients and inpatients. I won't be discussing outpatient imaging. COVID-19 precautions are used in radiology for any patient in droplet, or airborne isolation, a patient that has a COVID-19 test pending, 
or is suspicious for or confirmed COVID-19. It is important to remember that transporting patients in the hospital does carry minimal risk to staff and other patients. Imaging of COVID-19 patients have an impact on throughput of imaging for other patients and also can put our staff at risk. Only essential imaging should be ordered, and this imaging should change management of the patient. Please document in the order under the indication that the patient is suspected or confirmed COVID-19. This will help radiology staff recognize COVID-19 patients so they can don the appropriate PPE. Also, discuss the case with the radiologist. This will help us better triage multiple patients that have COVID-19. Another good reason to discuss your patient with the radiologist is so we can select the proper protocol to limit the times the patient has to return to radiology. Scheduling is a process in which the patient order is seen by the nurse assistant, which then decides when the patient will be coming to radiology and which scanner will be used. This is based on all other patients on the list and which scanners are being used at that time. If the patient is under COVID-19 precautions, the radiologist will communicate directly with the nurse assistant to determine which scanner to use and triage patients appropriately. If we are unable to triage multiple patients based on initial discussions with our referring clinicians, we ask the clinical services determine priority. The only added delay during the image portion of the imaging chain is donning and doffing of PPEs by the technologists. Otherwise, there's no change in the image acquisition. The equipment cleaning portion of the imaging chain is what delays our imaging throughput the most. Our cleaning equipment time is based on air exchanges per hour and time for environmental services to clean the rooms. CT scanners are up, down for about an hour, the MRI about an hour and 15 minutes, and the x-ray rooms depend on the air exchanges, but typically are between one hour and one and a half hours. It's important to note that sometimes EVS is being overwhelmed with cleaning other areas and may take longer to respond to radiology requests. Typically, we have seen delays up to two or three hours, but we've had one delay up to eight hours for a single study. It's important to recognize they are doing a good job and they are just understaffed at times. Other than meticulously evaluating lung parenchyma on non-chest imaging, such as neck and abdominal imaging, there won't be much differences in interpretation during the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the major differences in the imaging chain during the COVID-19 pandemic is the communication portion. If there are imaging findings of COVID-19 on a patient that is not suspected to have COVID-19, we will immediately call the provider and the imaging area to have the equipment cleaned. Now let me give you some of the radiology policies. All x-ray imaging on COVID patients should be portable. They should not be done in the radiology department. Ultrasound imaging should also be portable. If CT imaging is being requested, COVID-19 patients are imaged on CT2 on the third floor in the radiology department. For MRI imaging, we recommend limiting the use on COVID-19 patients. Please remember to communicate with radiology leadership for any issues that arise or for any policy or procedure changes that will affect imaging. Have a low threshold for calling radiology for questions regarding appropriate imaging. And please remember to place surgical masks on all patients coming to the radiology department. Please help us protect our techs. This includes x-ray, CT, and MRI techs, but also sonographers, which are at the highest risk due to close contact for extended amount of time. Limit ultrasounds to only essential examinations and use the term COVID-19 in the indication for suspected 
or confirmed COVID-19 patients. In summary, I hope I was able to illuminate the inner workings of radiology and the impact the COVID-19 pandemic has on imaging. Please remember to help us protect our patients and staff by using portable imaging, surgical masks on all patients, and use only essential imaging. Communicate with radiology leadership if issues arise or if there are policy changes. And please remember cleaning delays are approximately one hour per patient with COVID-19. However, EBS is understaffed and times vary greatly. Thank you for listening and please contact me with any questions you may have. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ali. My last name is Ghulam Reza Nejad. Probably it's the longest last name you have ever heard. I'm assistant professor of diagnostic radiology with Kick School of Medicine of University of Southern California. Uh, I work with the Department of Radiology Division of Emergency Radiology. It's a great honor for me to give a talk today on imaging features of coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. It will be a kind of image rich presentation. I'll show you a lot of images starting with this one, which is a 3D reconstruction of CT images of a patient with COVID-19. She was a young patient. Before I start, a brief review of what we did over the last three or four months on COVID-19. We started very early actually. I think the first manuscript that we worked on was about like January 15. At that time, there were not that many publications out there, maybe a couple of case reports, one or two original research. Uh, but we did this manuscript, we did this publication in Journal of the American College of Radiology to make sure that radiologists know about the imaging features of the disease and more importantly, to make sure that the radiology staff know how to deal with these patients. Because at that time, there were a couple of reports concerning about nosocomial transmission of the disease from China. And we wanted to make sure radiology staff, technicians, radiologists, nurses know how to deal with this patient, not, to, not only to protect themselves, but also to protect patients from uh, disease transmission. And after that, we had several publications, maybe eight or nine has already have already been published, and we have at least 10, 12 studies under review. The main question to be answered in this presentation is what is the best diagnostic approach to COVID-19? To answer this question, actually recently we did a new study. We did a country-based analysis of the diagnostic approach to COVID-19. We looked over different countries. We looked at China, where the disease started first, then we looked at South Korea, Japan, Iran, and then we went over European countries like Italy, Germany, Spain, UK, where they have a really high number of case, cases. And at the end, we looked at our national protocols and guidelines in the US. Based on this study, uh, let's start talking about China. In China, in December and January, actually, there was no RT-PCR kit at that time. It, the nasal swab test was not developed at that time. So the doctors in China at the very beginning only had the option of doing chest imaging. And for chest imaging, definitely, they use chest CT to have a better resolution because initially, in the very first step of the disease, chest X-ray can be negative. So they used chest CT. When even later on, like in, in some countries like Iran, because they didn't have enough uh, nasal swab test, RT-PCR test, they mainly relied on imaging. They did a lot of chest CT. There were a lot of CT scanners in the country, but there were not that many nasal swab tests. So they mainly used chest CT. When we come to Europe, there is a kind of combination of these approaches. They, in some areas, they used predominantly RT-PCR, in some areas they used uh, imaging. But what is our national protocols? Here in the US, we have enough access to RT-PCR, so there is no point to make the diagnosis of COVID-19 based on imaging. Should we do imaging? You may ask for imaging to evaluate the extent of lung involvement and to have a baseline to evaluate disease progression. And for this purpose, you only need to do a chest X-ray. Uh, 
when do we need to do a chest CT? Very rarely. Believe me, our doctors here in USC are doing a, an excellent job. And based on our study over the last couple of months, over the last, over more than 200 patients that we had in USC, I think there was only one chest CT done. You may only ask for chest CT if you're concerned about a kind of complication like superimposition of bacterial infection, abscess formation, pericardial effusion, pleural effusion that is like complicated by infection or like vascular complication, something like that. Usually what you need to do only RT-PCR and if you need imaging, chest x-ray gives you a lot of information. It's all what you need. This is another publication from our team. Uh, it's published in AJR in February. At that time, as I said, there were not that many publications. So we tried to collect data from similar coronavirus infections like SARS and MERS, and we compare it to limited available information from COVID-19. Uh, at that time, as I said, our knowledge was not perfect. If you see here, for example, we said that extra pulmonary findings in SARS and MERS can be seen, but in COVID-19 is mm, very uncommon. Now, after four months of the disease, we know that 10 to 15% of our patients may present with extra pulmonary findings. Imaging wise, as I said, sensitivity of RT-PCR kits, at least those earlier versions of RT-PCR was not that great, was about like 70%, while sensitivity of CT is 97 to 98% which means that some of your patients who have negative RT-PCR may have positive CT, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do CT to make the diagnosis. But if we do imaging, what do we see on imaging on chest X-ray or chest CT? To answer this question, we did a systematic review in early March. At that time, there was a good number of publications out there. Our systematic review consisted of 919 patients published in AJR. Uh, this is a very important table of that publication. It shows that 88% of our cases showed bilateral pulmonary involvement. 76% of the cases demonstrated peripheral distribution of the disease. 80% of the cases demonstrate prominent posterior lobe involvement, posterior aspect of the lung involvement compared to the anterior aspect of the lung. In 79% of the cases, the disease was multilobar. And in 88% of the cases, the opacity was grand glass. In 32%, there was consolidation. What is the difference between ground glass opacity and consolidation? I'll show you images later on to have a better understanding of the difference between these two types of uh, lung opacity. But in ground glass opacity, you can see the pulmonary vasculature through the opacification. In consolidation, you don't see the vascular structures through the opacity. This is a very typical case of COVID-19. As you see, there is multifocal pulmonary opacities. These opacities are mainly peripheral. The central part is some, somehow spurred. We don't see that much of central involvement. The lesions are mainly peripheral. You can see vasculature going through the opacity. This means that the lesions are grand glass. If you don't see the vascular structures through the opacity, it's consolidation. But this is the question, do all our patients show this typical pattern? Of course not. To answer this question, actually we did another study. In late March, we went over 37 studies published in literature to see what imaging features can this disease show. Based on our findings from these 37 studies, we proposed a grading system. Our grading system starts from zero to three, with the zero demonstrating very, very low suspicion for COVID-19, where the chest CT is completely normal. Grade one is when you have atypical features of the disease. For example, you see cavity, you see pleural effusion, you see pericardial effusion, you see 
lymphatic chest lymphatic neuropathy you see um, pulmonary nodules you see three in the butt appearance these features are very atypical for COVID-19 do I mean that for example we don't see pulmonary fibrosis or bronchiectasis in COVID-19 yes we may see but not in the early stage in our recent publications in very late stages of the disease especially like around the time that you want to discharge the patient some patients demonstrate pulmonary fibrosis or um, even bronchiectasis but at the very early stages these are very atypical for COVID-19 so we give it one which means low clinical suspicion for COVID-19 three is the most a uh, consistent imaging feature of COVID-19, like the case that I showed you before, multifocal peripheral grand glass opacities. It means that if the patient is in appropriate context, we have a high clinical sus um, suspicion for COVID-19. What is two? Two means something in between. For example, your patient has some typical features and some atypical features, which means moderate level of suspicion for COVID-19. Okay, here is another case. We have only one single ground glass opacity. Why I call it ground glass opacity? Because as you see here, we can follow the uh, vasculature through the opacification. It's only one single ground glass opacity. So based on our classification, it goes to grade two, which means a moderate suspicion for COVID-19. Why it's moderate why it's not high because it's single if it was multifocal we could grade it as three i mean high clinical concern for covid19 this is another good case a 58 year old male presented with fever cough and shortness of breath for a few days this is a very typical feature based on our classification it goes to grade three which means multifocal peripheral grand glass opacities as you say as you see the central part of the lung the perihala regions are spared the lesions are subrural peripheral they are multifocal and are grand glass opacities this is a very typical feature of the disease okay if you want to know how the disease progressed this is a very good case this is exactly the same patient that we saw in the previous slide three days after admission here are the images you see again we see those ground glass opacities but now we have superimposition of consolidations those areas of like more confluent white consolidation this is superimposed consolidation on ground glass opacities which means disease progression further follow-up on the same patient the same 58 year old male now six days after admission you see we have progression of consolidation there is no ground glass opacity almost the entire those grand glass opacities has been replaced by consolidation which means significant interval progression of inflammatory process and infection with COVID-19. Further follow-up on the same patient what was the clinical indication we don't know it was done in another country uh, we definitely discourage this kind of management because too much radiation for nothing these follow-up could be easily done by chest x-ray but for whatever reason they did and now we are showing the images of it again we see multifocal peripheral consolidation so we have a transition from grand glass opacities to consolidation here in some areas lower down in these coronal images you see air bronchogram and based on new studies air bronchogram and this many consolidations are a radiologic sign of poor prognosis of the patient a new patient she actually was one of our patients she was here in usc in county hospital actually she was a 30 year old female presented with cough and hemoptysis for five days as she had history of recent surgery the er attending was concerned about pe and they did a ct and geopulmonary and actually we didn't see any ctp any pe we didn't see any filling defect to such as pulmonary embolism but we saw these bilateral uh, aerospace consolidations it's not a typical feature of COVID-19 why because they are not peripheral they are mainly perihylar bilateral perihylar but as I said we could grade it as two moderate clinical suspicion they did RT-PCR and it came positive for COVID-19 this is another 
patient from County Hospital USC, 47 year old male, presented with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bandemia. They were concerned about intra-abdominal pathology, asked for CT abdominal pelvis with contrast. We didn't see any intra-abdominal pathology, but incidental finding was multifocal grand class opacities involving bilateral lung bases. This is a very, very typical picture of COVID-19. They did RT-PCR, patient was positive for COVID-19. But I wanted to say something here. We said CT is very sensitive for COVID-19. It's true sensitivity of 97, 98% compared to 70% of RT-PCR. Also, it's very sensitive, but it's not very specific. Exactly the same imaging feature can be seen in flu. So a specificity is not that great. The same patient can have just connective tissue disease, can have drug toxicity, can have organizing pneumonia, no COVID-19. So always keep it in your mind that CT is very sensitive, but not very specific. All the imaging findings should be interpreted in the clinical context. So far, we have seen a lot of chest CTs, but not that many X-rays. This is the chest X-ray exactly from the same patient that we saw in the last slide. The chest X-ray on the left is the X-ray at the admission and the chest x-ray on the right is seven days after the admission on the admission you see few small multifocal error space opacities seven day seven days later we have significant interval progression of multifocal uh, consolidations and as you see the patient progressed so rapidly and at this time she he was intubated here is another patient from uh, County Hospital, USC, 64 year old male, again presented with abdominal pain and fever. As you see, most of our cases that we have a CT done, they presented with extra pulmonary manifestations. For a pulmonary manifestation it, itself, we haven't had any chest CT done. All these CTs are done when the patient had extra pulmonary manifestations and there was no clinical concern for COVID-19. This patient, we didn't see anything in the abdomen and pelvis to explain the patient abdominal pain, but in the lung basis, we saw bilateral airspace opacities, which is based on our grading system three, I mean, typical for COVID-19. If you look at the patient chest X-ray, I don't see that much in it. This is why we say sensitivity of chest X-ray in the early stages of the disease is significantly lower than a chest CT. Chest X-ray can be completely negative. Here is another patient, 73-year-old uh, female with history of appendectomy, status post x lab and cholecystectomy presented with diffuse abdominal pain. They ask for CT abdominal pelvis to evaluate for any possible intra-abdominal pathology. We didn't see anything in the uh, abdomen and pelvis to explain the patient's symptoms, but incidental finding was note of bilateral peripheral grand glass opacities involving bilateral lung bases, as you see, um, which was concerning for COVID-19, and the patient's uh, nasal swab test was also positive. This is another patient, again, presented with abdominal pain on CT abdomen and pelvis. We see fluid-filled, mildly dilated ascending colon with mild pericolic stranding, a small mesenteric link node, which is in favor of a non-specific colitis. But if you look at the long basis, we see bilateral peripheral grand glass opacity. So as you see, a significant number of our patients, 10 to 15% present with extra pulmonary symptoms. This is another case of extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19. 60 year old female presented with four days of dry cough without fever or dyspnea, they did a chest CT and as you see there is a small pericardial effusion here and here and on the long window you see bilateral mainly peripheral grand glass opacities typical feature of COVID-19 and the patient's RT-PCR was positive. Can patients with COVID-19 have pural effusion? Yes of course they can but it's not a typical feature of the disease. If we go back to our grading system presence of pleural effusion put your patient in grade one which means atypical and 
lower likelihood of um, COVID-19, but it doesn't necessarily exclude the disease. In this case, you see bilateral grand glass opacities. It's not very typical. Why? Because it's perihilar. You see uh, right-sided pleural effusion. As you see here, there is a small to moderate size pericardial effusion, but the patient's RT-PCR was positive for COVID-19. What about mediastinal lymphadenopathy? If our patients have lymphadenopathy, is it consistent with COVID-19? Based on our grading system and systematic review, no. Lymphadenopathy is not a typical feature of COVID-19, but it doesn't exclude the disease. Look at this patient, 59-year-old male with positive RT-PCR. They did a chest CT. We see bilateral grand grass opacities, mainly peripheral. I would call imaging of the lung. If, if it was only the lung window, I would call it grade uh, 3 because it's very typical for COVID-19. But when we go to soft, visual, soft tissue window, when we, do, when we see this mediastinal lymphadenopathy, it goes back lower down into grade 2 because mediastinal lymphadenopathy is not a typical feature of COVID-19. In this case, RT-PCR was positive though. This is another patient from another country, 60-year-old male presented with chest pain, loss of appetite, nausea, no fever, no shortness of breath. As the patient has history of cabbage, they were concerned about ischemic heart disease. They asked for CT angiocoronary. And as you see, all the grafts are patent. Like you see Lima, you see SVGs are patent, but incidental finding was multifocal peripheral grand glass opacities consistent with COVID-19. So these days, even if your patients present with atypical features, we have to put COVID-19 high within the differential diagnosis. Again, another patient, 40-year-old female presented with shortness of breath, no fever, no cough, the cardiologist was concerned for ischemic heart disease and coronary artery disease. They asked for CT angiocoronary. As you see, all the coronary arteries are patent. There is no significant uh, coronary artery stenosis, but incidental note is made of bilateral peripheral aerospace consolidations concerning for COVID-19 and the patient's RT-PCR nasal swab test came back positive. So far, I have shown you a lot of um, CT images, but not that, that many x-rays. And the reason is that um, CT shows us a better picture of lung parenchyma, which helps us better understand what we may expect to see on x-ray. Based on that knowledge and that understanding, now we can go over some x-rays. Uh, in a chest x-ray, based on what we see on a CT, we can expect multifocal bilateral peripheral aerospace opacities, mainly involving lung bases. Here is a patient, 70-year-old male with fever and cough, whose RT-PCR test was positive. As you see, there are bilateral aerospace opacities, mainly involving the lung bases, which is somehow correspond to what we saw on our CTs. This is another patient, 45-year-old male with fever and cough and positive RT-PCR test. Again, we have bilateral lung opacities, mainly involving the lung peripheral areas. And in this case, actually mainly involves the mid-lung of bilateral lungs. Okay, another case, 61-year-old female with shortness of breath, cough and fever, positive RT-PCR. On the x-ray, we see somehow well-defined aerospace opacity involving the peripheral right lung base and a smaller aerospace opacity in the left lung base. But as I said before, x-ray is not a very sensitive modality for COVID-19. In some patients, you don't see any imaging finding in favor of COVID-19. Look at this case, 78-year-old male with shortness of breath and cough and positive RT-PCR, I don't see any aerospace opacity to support the diagnosis of COVID-19. We have bronchiectasis involving the left upper lung, which is atypical for COVID-19 based on our classification is grade 
one, but I don't see any airspace opacity to suggest COVID-19. So a negative X-ray doesn't exclude COVID-19. Another patient, 43-year-old female with again fever, cough, and shortness of breath, positive RT-PCR, and this one is, I would say, completely normal chest X-ray. I don't see any abnormality. So again, a negative chest X-ray cannot exclude COVID-19. This is another paper from our group. What do we know about the long-term pulmonary consequences of COVID-19? Do all the patients recover completely and go back to their baseline? Not necessarily. Actually, a lot of patients like this one, he is the same person that we had the follow-up during the course of hospitalization. He is that person, 58-year-old male. As you see, after hospital discharge, he has residual airspace consolidations. So not all patients recover completely and not all of our patients go back to the normal baseline. A lot of patients have residual airspace disease. How long they stay there? We don't know. There is an old study from SARS. They follow up their patients from 2003 to 2018 and they saw that some of their patients, even after 15 years of follow up, they have residual scar. They have residual organizing pneumonia. Uh, what are the risk factors for residual pulmonary disease? There are a lot of different factors. We don't know about COVID-19. It's too early. We need to do follow-up longitudinal studies, but based on SARS and MERS, probably having underlying pulmonary disease, older patients having risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and these kind of risk factors place the patient at a high risk of having residual pulmonary consequences. And interestingly, some of these patients have residual pulmonary function abnormalities. So it's not only on imaging that we see residual consequence of COVID-19 but or coronavirus disease, but also in the pulmonary function test, we have some residual abnormalities. This is a short letter, uh, an editorial letter from our group published in AJR. Uh, the main message of this paper was the fact that uh, imaging features of the disease does not necessarily correspond to the clinical picture of the disease. You may have a patient with severe imaging findings but minimal clinical symptoms. Or the other way, you may have a patient with minimal imaging findings but severe clinical symptoms. This is why we always say clinical correlation is recommended because imaging features and clinical features does not necessarily correlate. Thank you very much again for participating in this ground round and giving me the opportunity to give this talk. It was a great honor for me and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much.